Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight and being with us. Um, this is NET402. It's a deep dive on AWS networking infrastructure. I'm JR Rivers. I'm a senior principal engineer in infrastructure services organization. We're the group that builds the stuff that makes AWS run, the concrete, the power, the network, the servers, the racks, all that stuff. That's what lives in our organization. Um, I'm specifically focused on networking. Um, for the next hour, we're going to go through and talk about some of the concepts and technologies that we use to build the AWS network. Um, some of it's going to be the how, some of it's going to be the why. Um, and we're kind of on that never-ending quest to make customers effectively see the network as invisible to themselves. I'm here with Stephen Callahan. Stephen, take it away. Thanks, JR. As the slide mentioned, I'm Stephen Callahan. I'm also a senior principal network engineer. Um, I've spent the last 12 years trying to evolve the AWS data center network. So as mentioned, we work in infrastructure and we focus on the underlay. So that's what connects the AWS servers to each other and to the rest of the world. Speaking about this physical world publicly is pretty rare for us. So it's exciting to share with you how we think about operating a network like ours and why we think it's ready for all of your workloads. We have been advised to start with a warning. This was originally scheduled as a 300 series talk. However, after some dry runs, we were upgraded to a 400 series talk. We felt it was important to go truly deep. Even still, this will be a particularly technical 400 series talk where we assume a high level of knowledge about AWS services and networking standards. In terms of an agenda, we'll start in traditional Amazon fashion with the talk about some of the tenets that help us guide our decisions. We'll then talk about some of the complexities of the real world versus the ideal we'd all love to live in. We'll then review a history of the network and how we got to where we are today before we highlight a handful of some of the hardware and software innovations that we've brought to help solve some of the problems that we feel that we have so that we can provide you, the customers, with the experience you should expect. Before we get too into the details of the session, like Jera mentioned, we just want to be clarifying how AWS thinks about networking. We think in terms of routers, switches, cables, data centers, internet connectivity. We're also responsible for the management of the over one million network devices that we have that connect all these things together. We work very closely with EC2 networking and the edge networking services you see here. And there are a number of great talks this year on these sessions, on these topics, um, in the computer networking tracks. However, we're here to talk about what's underneath all of those things and how we physically connect them together. So when we're done, we don't want any questions about, well, how does my VPC connect with my NLB and my ALF and whatever acronym we don't know about? We're underlay infrastructure people. Um, but before we talk about the technology or kind of the how we do this, we really want to go through the why we do it. And the, the why is, is suitably important as we go through this here. Um, Amazon thinks in terms of tenants. We write them in front of our docs and we start a project. Every project lists out its tenants. And sometimes um, these tenants become the guiding principles that we use to make our decisions. For us, our highest priority is protecting customer data. You trust us with your data. It is our highest priority to make sure that it's completely safe. So we employ common techniques such as tra auditing transactions from tooling when they access devices. We use contingent authorization. If any human needs to get onto a device for some uh, remediation system or investigation. Um, but we kind of go a few steps further than that that are atypical. Um, one of them is that we encrypt every, or otherwise tamper-proof, any link that leaves our control. That encryption lives, uh, is on top of, or in addition to, any other transport layer encryption that exists. So for instance, if you're using EC2 in transit encryption, our link level encryption further encrypts the packet. So it gets to be a big jumbled mess of bits that no one can figure out what it means. Um, but in the end, it, get, it gives the best protection for the customer data that we can provide. We also do something that's, again, atypical in that we sanitize any piece of equipment that leaves our red zones. Sanitize means we find anything that's non-volatile and might possibly have any data on it, whether it's a customer data, our own internal operating data, software, you know, certificates, anything like that. 
that gets removed and physically destroyed before anything ever leaves our red zone. Um, it's, for us, slightly painful because sometimes it's like, there'll be a problem with a piece of hardware. We'd love to get it back into our lab so we can get in the middle of it and figure out what's broken. And that can take three months because that's how long it takes to go through that process. But we do that because security is our highest priority. There is no cloud without a network. I'm sure you've seen, there, there's a t-shirt I've seen somewhere like, it, like cloud is just using someone else's computer. It's not quite the trick case, right? The cloud is using a computer that's accessible from almost anywhere, which requires communication. Availability is incredibly important to us. We developed the, the technology and we spent a lot of time discussing failure modes and blast radius or like the effect of an E1 failure as we go through and architect our software and our hardware systems. Um, the network itself, as we'll discuss much, you know, quite a bit today, is built of a, a lot of redundant switches and links. Um, we provision redundant capacity to all layers. We monitor that capacity to ensure that the network always meets our expectations. We put our switches on diverse power feeds. A lot of people do that in colo locations. You, you may ha have hosting things in colos yourselves. We also use backup systems. A lot of colos have those, have those as well. We have redundant backup systems, so we'll put our network switches on diverse power feeds with diverse backup systems so that we can take a hit almost anywhere and not bring down the whole network or in a whole data center. Um, a less obvious consideration, consideration is that um, when fiber, when we run our fiber paths, it ends up that a lot of times uh, you'll see fiber converge when it's going like crossing over a river, and so you'll get fiber from a bunch of different sources, sources and destinations, not just AWS, whoever happens to be in that metro area, they'll all converge into a single conduit, go across the river, and then go off on their merry little way. Well, that little stretch is what we call the shared risk link group, or SR, SRLG. We monitor the fiber paths and the geolocation of all of our fiber lays to make sure that there will be no data center that is ever isolated because of a cut to a single conduit. So we ensure that we have that availability always in the network. So we deliver network capacity when and where customers need it, whether that's building new regions, scaling existing regions, uh, introducing you know, local zones, outposts, wavelength zones, all of those things are what we're there for. We have to be able to leave customers unconstrained. We accomplish this by developing a lot of the hardware and software technology ourselves. We utilize multiple suppliers from almost everything, including printed circuit boards, networking systems on a chip, the little ASICs that make the networking things work, which we'll talk more about a little bit later, um, manufacturers and rack integrators. This diverse supply chain allows us to work around little issues that might occur along the way, such as a particular supplier might have a quality problem or they might not be able to meet our demand at any one point in time. People are used to that. But it ends up it also helps us in global situations. Like if you look at what happened in COVID-19 or with the semiconductor supply challenges of 2021, we were able to continuously provide capacity when and where customers needed it. And lastly, performance. In my early days in networking, I was working with some reasonably old people, um, which is kind of crazy because I'm pretty old myself now. Um, and one of the, the veterans that I was working with said, hey, would you rather have better metering light algorithms to get onto the freeway or would you rather have a wider freeway? And I was like, oh, I guess that kind of stuck with me forever. We believe at AWS to build our network on a very high performance foundation. With that said, we still use traffic engineering and a lot of the modern techniques to improve customer experience, but that high performance foundation allows us to, to be more judicious and thoughtful about how we use traffic engineering and not have to use traffic engineering in order to make this system work. All of this is done in a quest to deliver seemingly infinite bandwidth to your applications. And now that we've talked about some of the tenants, let's kind of start thinking about the network a little bit deeper. You develop business applications using a combination of AWS services, your custom logic, and you expect these things to be able to communicate amongst themselves inside of AWS with devices on your sites and with entities on the internet. Pretty straightforward, right? That's what the cloud's all about, right? Everything's kind of touching each other. We already went through that, right? So 
the ideal network in this world is a great big fat bus bar with infinite port count and zero latency. But remember, we have a lot of you out there, and you don't want the others of you to see what's going on. So we need to provide multi-tenancy in our ideal network, and it can never break, right? However, much like the transporter on Star Trek, humans haven't invented that technology yet, so we have to try to approximate it. We do this by building a network that's comprised of a bunch of, of IP switches, um, also called routers, typically thousands of routers or switches per data center, and they're interconnected with tens of thousands of links. The data centers themselves are typically connected with hundreds or thousands of links. And we'll get into the speeds later on, but this, these are very, very, very large numbers here. And multi-tenancy becomes very, very interesting in this world. As you can imagine, we have this underlay technology that Stephen mentioned prior, and there are a lot of different overlay systems that run on top of this to provide multi-tenancy. Some of them are internal to AWS, but one of the more publicly visible ones that most people are familiar with is virtual private cloud. Um, and if you want to learn more about virtual private cloud and get your head wrapped around how multi-tenancy might unfold, take a look at Eric Brandwine's talk, Another Day, Another Billion Packets. It's a fantastic breakdown of how virtual private cloud works uh, from an overlay, underlay, and, in, and a security mechanisms. Now, all this is great in theory, except for we have to constantly improve the network, which means that we have planned activities, such as updating configurations and upgrading device software. We, have, we scale the network, we improve our tooling. And inevitably, there's this little character named Murphy that runs around and starts messing with us along the way. And devices fail, and we have software faults, and links get cut. All of these things start to make, take, compromise our ability to approximate this ideal situation. And again, we'll kind of dig into some of that a little bit later on. But few people at AWS have more insight as to the journey that we've been on and this paradox between the ideal and the real than Stephen. So he's going to take over here at this point. So in the 12 years I've been here, I think we've gone through a number of shifts in how we think about operating the network. A few months after I joined the company back in 2010, AWS's top engineer, James Hamilton, published this blog post. In essence, he was highlighting a challenge with how we were building the network and the architecture that was there, and that we were limiting innovation and new products in the services. This was related to the release of the first cluster compute instance type, CC1. And this was the press release that we announced from 2010. This was a turning point for AWS infrastructure as it represented the first of what became our new normal. We moved away from buying refrigerator-sized devices from network vendors, and we built a network for our purposes specifically for these things. This was to enable the placement groups for cluster computing which provided non-blocking bandwidth between any two hosts in that group. We'll get into non-blocking shortly. It's a fun topic. James's expectation still resonates today as we focus on making a network so secure, reliable, and performant that you, our cloud customers, should not have to worry about it. We were building, we started the journey on building that great big bus bar that was constantly growing, improving, and being maintained with the minimal of external awareness. So if I look back on the past, I think there have been three major shifts in the network technology that influence how we think about growing and operating the network. First, we were consuming what was already assembled and available from others in the market. Then we created our own devices and designs out of the core components that were available, building the foundational systems that we needed to grow. And then finally, we've moved to innovate in directions that specifically meet our own needs. As time goes on, this may have been for scale or availability, repeatability, consistency, operations, the list just keeps getting longer. So to begin with, this is around 2010, like I mentioned, we were purchasing hardware and software from the big names of the networking world. We were using thousands of their large platforms and we were building basic automation to ensure that we could generate configuration, deploy it safely, and take rudimentary actions like steering traffic around without human intervention. However, our problems began when we became some of the largest consumers of these platforms, 
and we were pushing the hardware and software far beyond what other customers were doing. We also had concerns with the complexity and blast radius of a single device in this role. This is hundreds of ASICs, most of which are opaque to operations, which makes it very tricky to diagnose what's going on. Maintenance, too, with the potential for bent pins internally within the chassis, meant we occasionally had to do things like chassis swaps. These are incredibly painful to orchestrate. They can take days, and they leave us with reduced redundancy for an unacceptable amount of time. Much less the gorillas required to move those things around. Yes. <laughs> so coming out of this era and into the create, we had a few clear desires. We knew that Moore's Law was still pushing companies like TSMC to continue to improve lithography. This meant transistor counts for a given die size would continue to increase. We also knew we wanted to own the code that ran on our own routers to give a level of control we could only dream of in the earlier phases. Scaling with cookie cutter designs is kind of necessary. So we defined the right standards that gave us a level of flexibility, but not require decisions at every junction. And this is where we align with a lot of the messaging you might hear from EC2, VPC, and Hyperplane. These are cellular designs. Like I tried to approximate here, we inherently limit the fault to within that cell so that the focus does not, the error does not leak out to other areas. Most important though, when we look at the tenets for this area, is we needed this to be something we could continually evolve. There was no final state. It was just a path we wanted to move along. So one thing that it is important to mention related to chassis is that we've made some core decisions about the elements that make up our network. We don't like chassis. <laughs> they are cumbersome, like I mentioned. They have failure characteristics we don't like. And most importantly for this create phase, it takes a lot of tightly coupled effort to create a new one. They have many discrete components, most of which are largely abstracted from operations. And personally, I've lost count of the number of switch fabric errors that can only be resolved by rebooting the chassis. And if it's a large chassis, it's a very large task. So we extensively use single chip platforms. These are typically one rack unit tall, have all our ports at the front, and we can mix and match different flavors when needed. So we classify the devices typically on speed, a 3.2T switch, a 12.8T switch. We multi-source, like JR mentioned, most of these components so that we can swap between them when needed. One thing that might is, I think, is a little special to AWS is we use the same class of device in nearly every layer of our network. Any individual device could be a top of rack switch, an aggregation network, a core network, a backbone network, internet facing, we use them everywhere. We do do some specialization when it brings us benefit, such as switches with hardware encryption modules, like JR mentioned, when the fiber leaves our building. But it's a pretty small set of devices. We also internally productize these devices into full racks. We're not deploying one device here or there, but instead we have our system integrators create an entire rack of these switches, cabled together as a single deployment unit. This same deployment unit, again, can go into any of those locations. So how do we use these racks? Well, the basis of our very modern network actually harks back to the 1940s and 1950s. Engineers in Bell Labs were looking for a way to create a large telephone switch that could be made of small telephone switches. This was first patented in 1941 and then formalized in 1952, or yeah, 1952 by a French engineer named Charles Clot. This is what a fully non-blocking eight-port switch looks like made out of four-port devices. Now, what do I mean by fully non-blocking? I mean that any port can be at use at 100% capacity at the same time with no congestion. This was a necessity in your phone call circuit switching days, but in packet-based networks, we can maintain this capacity with some good modeling where we deploy the capacity as needed. We first use this uh, architecture, which is now commonly called the folded fat tree design in 2010, when we were looking to solve that cluster compute requirement. 
like I mentioned, key to that was the incremental growth. So our designs scale from a single rack of 32 devices to potentially 5,000 devices within a single placement group. To do this, using that merchant silicon, which is something akin to taking Intel or AMD CPU from the plethora of um, system integrators, we then added our own software on top, and we tweaked the network design to these use cases. At one layer, like the aggregation, we might want a lot of ports, but we don't need that much bandwidth. At another, like in the backbone, we want the maximum amount of bandwidth, but the minimal amount of rack space, power, and cooling. So we're now in the create phase, and we were creating these core concepts that we wanted the ability to iterate and kind of improve things over time. We had created these core basic building blocks, and we were developing an operating system that would work with our hardware strategy. Today, there are plenty of network OS platforms that do this, but when we got started, we had to pick a model to get us going and allow us to iterate freely. So an example of where we were doing this still in the early days was we were using an externally provided implementation of standard routing protocols, such as BGP. Initially, we optimized our designs around those boundaries that were already set. However, as we grew and we operated this network, we weren't happy with some of the restrictions this meant. So we knew we could get a lot of benefit by tweaking a timer here or adding a specific feature there. But when you start doing that, you need to maintain these fabrics. We now have many order of magnitude more devices than we had before. So we needed a large automation system to build. Things like configuration generation, deploying, conf deploying to the fleet safely, they were all achieved by taking humans out of the loop. This required some automated processes to ensure we were keeping the network, what we call perpetually consistent. We also had many more cables because of this. And so as a result, we needed to advance our active telemetry, alarming, and triangulation systems to pinpoint where these faults were happening and then engage an auto remediation system to take that link out of service automatically. With these systems, or sorry, without these systems, we would have needed hundreds of people just maintaining the network. But with them, much like we are today, we still run without a network operations center. So this orchestration enabled us to like, double our region growth count in the mid-2010s. And so new regions went from a rare bespoke thing to something that, luckily for some software teams, was just another stage in their software pipeline. So on my timeline, we're up to about 2013, and we've had the first iteration of nearly all of the systems that we still use today. However, we've not yet moved to this innovate phase, which was to break away from assembling networks from the building blocks that existed externally and to move into true innovation of components that made sense to us, but maybe not anybody else. So I vividly remember working with a hardware engineer on a, a potential new network ASIC. And as a network engineer, I asked the typical speeds and feeds, how many ports, how much memory, and I got an answer which made me stop and rethink. What would you like it to be? Backwards compatibility or more memory was now an engineering trade-off that we could consider, and it was not predetermined. Until that point, we were working with things that other people had designed for us. But now we're innovating beyond what was ready for mass market. We were developing fully custom hardware, some of which we'll talk about later, and we were embracing new technologies earlier and with more control than was possible before. The same thing can happen in software when you control multiple domains. We could now elect to resolve a fiber cut at the optical layer rather than the network layer. We could do this because we controlled the network device, we could add link damping that didn't make sense to external people, but because we knew the optical layer was underneath, it would handle it for us. But core to making these decisions, as I come back on the tenets, is we need to make them consistently. We never want to get into the place of making something just because we can. It needs to be tied with tangible benefit. One example of this is when we went to meet that network encryption need. 
this was ensuring that any traffic that leaves our control is encrypted with MACSEC, a layer two protocol, or layer, layer two security protocol. We initially tried using commercially available encryption products, but we struggled within the limitations that were there, and their life in the network was short-lived. So the flexibility that we had in those early days meant that we could create a variant device of the one you see here with a hardware encryption module which was otherwise a standard router and would meet the customer security promise but still fit within our designs. That device also uh, integrated some innovative optical modules, which we'll touch on later. One thing that's a constant tension with innovation, which like you probably see yourselves, is complexity. We always want to be innovating and improving the experience for our customers making new opportunities and making it so that great big bus never becomes a problem. In the consume world, our innovation levels were low. We were working within the design limits that were there and we were very restricted. However, as we grew and we started exceeding those limits, we were frustrated. Complexity was on the rise without much benefit. And these rare events were happening far too often and we were responding to each one uniquely. If we were to innovate from a complex world and didn't reduce that complexity, we would have ended up overwhelmed. This could be because we can't deploy quickly enough or we were spending more time fighting fires than preventing them. If, ever, if every opportunity had a new answer on multiple fronts, then we were fighting combinatorics and we would be running to standstill. So the sweet spot, which like you all probably want to do yourself, is be in that lower right quadrant. High levels of innovation without complexity, without that burden of combinatorial failures and unwanted interactions between systems. The efficiencies of scale come from having decisions made in advance. So we strive to live in that lower right. To do so, we look for patterns, be they in design or in operations, doing failure analysis and going deep when a system doesn't make it easy to do the right thing. Keeping complexity at bay is an ongoing effort. So this balance is typified by one of the AWS data center network core teams, core principles of simplicity scales. This phrase has been around for many years now and it is my personal favorite. I've lifted this directly from the internal wiki. What's important to consider is that our tenants are often at tension with one another. Alone, this might lead you in a path that limits innovation and reduces any flexibility to meet new requirements. However, if we couple this with never constrain the customer, we now have a purposeful tension that seeks out to be of balance, enable innovation but, and constant improvement while considering the complexity, not just for today, but also for the future. Stephen pointed out simplicity scales. That's our core tenet. Complex systems get made out of simple building blocks. We're trying to like, point out to you exactly how complex the AWS network is. And our whole goal here is to let you know that we build this so that your applications are completely unconstrained. My networking journey began long, long ago in a world far, far away. Um, in, it was a day of yellow cabled ethernet. It was 10 megabits per second. It ran through the attic and between the floors and up and down the elevator shafts. And we connected to that big yellow ethernet cable with these things called vampire taps. And there's a picture of one of those here on the slide. It ends up that big yellow cable was shared by everybody in the building. And at the time, there was a general perception that ethernet would never ever work for voice much less video. Today, the AWS network is made out of 12.8 terabit per second switches with 32 ports all running at 400 gigabits per second. That's thousands of links, or actually literally tens of thousands of links per data center, each of which is 40,000 times faster than that big fat yellow cable we were looking at before. And they're all running independently, they are not shared. This allows our customers to run high data and high performance workloads 
interactive business applications, gaming, and interactive video applications, all without worrying about how the network behaves. They're all running together at the same time because we have such a performance system. We apply a knot of technology to make the AWS network make sure it meets our performance expectations. But these switches embody much more than the finely tuned bit moving machines. We've talked a lot about that supply diversity, which it sounds like it's kind of simple motherhood and apple pie, but it takes a lot of discipline to do this. We are one of the very few people in the world that, that take this level of, of investment to ensure that we're always able to deliver capacity when and where you, the customers, want to have it. So as you can see, this hardware is pretty impressive. A lot of heat sinks and semiconductors and fans and all that really cool stuff. If you want to see one of these things live, we have one in AWS Village in the networking booth. So you can come by tomorrow and take a look at it if you like. Um, underlying all of that really impressive looking hardware is a relatively simple block diagram. These switches start off with a networking system on a chip, 12.8T device. Um, they include a CPU subsystem that runs our control plane and our management applications and our operating system. Those systems on a chip, um, we, we run, we, we, sorry, we use a lot of common packet techniques. So we don't use anything custom, nothing special. It's all standard IP technology. Anything you should be able to read about in an RFC or in some network education book. We make all of our desires and requirements transparent to the industry. We consume devices from multiple suppliers and test them and integrate and build against them, and we deploy them into our network, not just to make sure that they're interoperable, which some people do, but we make sure that they're interchangeable. We can take a device or a system built with you know, a device from manufacturer X and replace it with a device made by manufacturer Y and be completely confident the network behaves as expected. We use QSFP modules or QSFP connectors to house our optical modules. As we began architecting the latest generation of switches, we started thinking about how we deal with uh, the access of last resort. What happens if something's going wrong? We want to get access to the system. We want to power it off. We want to access fault logs, that sort of thing. Um, if you're familiar with server architectures, there's this thing called a baseboard management controller that you find on a lot of servers that provide that level of access. And it ends up that some switches uh, employ a baseboard management controller as well. When we started looking at that and the characteristics of it, those things are yet another CPU subsystem with a CPU and DRAM and a bespoke operating system and, and software stack that run on them. We started looking at that and saying, wow, that's yet another moving part that we have to manage and that could fail and then will affect us at the time when we really, really, really need this thing. So we started becoming slightly concerned. Our hardware engineers started thinking about it, and they came up with this really clever innovation. Uh, it, it doesn't really have a formal name, but I'm going to call it a hardware BMC. Um, and what it is, it's, it's a way for us to uh, control the power and access logs on a device from the serial port. It's completely implemented in hardware. There are no software elements to it. Um, and it's accessed through our serial console network, which happens to be one of the most simple and reliable communication systems in all of the infrastructure. So by combining these two pieces together, we we're able to securely and reliably access a device when we really, really, really need to do that. When you look at the, the optical modules, uh, up until this 400 gigabit generation, um, the, the modules themselves use what was called on-off keying. This is when the, the lasers are resonating, and what you do is you turn the light on and off going down the fiber. It's kind of like Morse code for the, for the sake of discussion. Um, with this level of, with the, the latest generation modules, we've had to move beyond on-off keying. We've moved to phase amplitude modulation. It's an analog signaling mechanism on the optical media, somewhat similar to how your cell phone works in, in a high, you know, far away look, you know, squinting kind of way. Um, but it does require digital signal processing to make sure that we get desired link reliability. We started looking at that system and said, look, we're going to want to monitor this data really intently. And we know for sure that as we gain experience and work with our partners, we're going to go, want to go through and update this DSP firmware in the fleet while things are running. So how do we, how do we make this work? What's going to happen here? So 
it ends up that uh, the, the QSFP modules are generally connected with this thing called the Inner Integrated Circuit Bus. It's I2C is what it's short, it's short for, or is short for that. Um, it's a low-speed peripheral bus typically used to access things like fans and other components inside of a server or a, a networking switch or any kind of hardware, low-level hardware subsystem. Um, historically, the bus was used for very low-performance things. For optical modules, it was typically things like gaining inventory or reading the light levels on the transmit side or the received optical power. Um, so these were very, very low-frequency, low-throughput accesses. And the bus itself runs at about a megabit per second, which you can imagine, okay, that, that could work out in the old days. But as we started looking at the telemetry and the, the bandwidth required to download DSP firmware, we didn't want any of that to interrupt our operations. So we studied the needs, and our hardware engineers came up with yet another innovation. Uh, we call it a module access offload. What we've done is we have, a, we've created a piece of a hard, a hardware device that allows independent access to every optical module slot. So we can access all of them in parallel at whatever speed they're able to be accessed at. Along with that innovation, we offloaded a bunch of the tasks that were previously performed by the CPU, freeing up software, CPU cycles for software and offloading it onto the hardware. This mechanism allowed us to capture detailed operating information and upgrade modules whenever we see fit all without impacting customers. And while the high performance data path switches are kind of this, we'll call it the sexy part of this whole thing, like a lot of people like to talk about this stuff, as Stephen pointed out, we look at the system holistically and it ends up that we use out of band management switches and, and serial console servers to access devices, both, both the switches themselves as well as our servers. Um, and these are key pieces of AWS infrastructure. Given the importance of the reliability and the security of this part of the network, we've taken on designing, manufacturing these, these systems ourselves and writing the software that runs on them so that we have complete control of the hardware supply chain and all of the software supply chain of these incredi incredibly critical components. Like I mentioned before, by moving <coughs> to the Clo network, we've shifted some complexity away from the devices and into the interconnect. Since the break from 10 gig, which was around for a long time, the networking industry has moved at pace through the 40 gig, 100 gig, and now 400 gig generations. These regular speed increases were mostly a tweak to our design and maybe a new cable. However, at 400 gig, we had another interaction with that physical world. These are not your regular cables. Within a standard rack that we tend to deploy, we use 32 network devices. We take half those ports to connect north, half those ports to connect south, meaning there's 256 cables between the top half of the, top half of the rack and the bottom half of that rack. Now, for performance and reliability purposes, we like direct attached copper cables. I'm sure a lot of you do too. However, as link speed has increased, so has the requirements on the signals of these cables meaning thicker cables. So, like says here, at 100 gig, the standard two and a half meter cable was okay at a 6.7 mil outside diameter. That's okay. But at 400 gig, that's now 11 mil. And thanks to Pi, that's three times thicker. And also, much stiffer. Each of these cables is as thick and as stiff as the power that comes into most North American homes. That's three aught gauge cable. So this is not a fun task for people to cable up. So there are alternatives that we could try. Active optical cables have been around for a while, but they introduce more latency and they're not as reliable. The same is true if we were to use straight optical transceivers and patch cables. So this relatively simple problem of the stiffness of the cable could have us re-engineer one of the core components that we have of the AWS network being a rack of switches. So to minimize the impact of this, we started working with some of our industry partners and we sought out active electrical cables. These have retimers and enable these thinner cables without the optical conversion. This took some time, but now that they're available, during the build process, we can swap out one part for another and make it a net win. 
I am skipping the part where we have to power them, but we'll come to that later. If, by the way, if you're interested in seeing what one of these things looks like, again, you can come by the booth at the AWS Village and we have a couple of these on hand that you can take a look at. Yep. Another example of innovation, when a problem that you may only see at scale are the optical connectors. This is what we use to connect the racks together inside a building. And like JR mentioned, for the past several years, QSFP um, connect interfaces have been able to run at a single connection or a breakout connection. This started for us in about 2012 with the 40 gig or 4 by 10 gig. So coming up to modern times, we now have 400 gig interfaces, but sometimes we want to connect at 100 gig instead. So the standard way of doing this is, like you see on the left, is a breakout cable. You connect that to a patch rack at the side that's purely there to handle incoming connections. These patching racks are problematic for our data center folks. They're passive racks. They must be located directly beside the routers, but they're passive. So that means there's no power coming in, and therefore there's no heat going out. It's not great for thermal management when you think of the rack beside it of routers may be emitting 40 kilowatts of heat. This patch rack also takes up valuable data center space over an entire building that might be a whole aisle of a data center. So to tackle this, we created a connector type that allows four standard single mode fiber cables to connect, connect directly into that QSFP interface. This allowed us to eliminate that patch rack. And while the space savings are nice, it also eliminated one more connector in the chain improving reliability and reducing the potential for signal loss. So in working with one of our connector providers who manufactured these components, we've also now made that available on the market. So anyone else who, who has these problems can also take advantage of this. Moving up the stack one more time, now with the data center interconnect space. This is where we connect buildings to each other in a metro area, like in an AZ. We spend a lot of time thinking and optimizing this space. As you can imagine, somewhere like Virginia has a large source of complexity in how we connect those data centers together. We also noted that early adoption was key here. We knew that investing early on a given technology meant that we could drive up reliability and also increase part availability so we have the right suppliers. We were super early on a technology called 400 gig Xeor. This enabled us to put a long-reach, tunable optic directly into a router. That tunable optic meant that we could remove the need for a separate DWDM transponder system, therefore simplifying the network. But we also realized that early on that the target reach of 80 kilometers for this optic was not going to give us the optimum coverage we needed in our network. So we worked with the OIF, or the Optical Innovation Forum members, to deliver a longer reach version of this pluggable. That worked up to 400 kilometers. That proved to be the right decision for us, and it's now a standard called 400 gig Z or plus. It's also becoming widely adopted. Now, you might be able to spot some of the fun technical challenges in terms of uh, that module, mostly in terms of that extra little heat sink you see on the top of the diagram. It turns out when you cram a lot of electronics and optics into a small package, it consumes more power and therefore emits more heat. To handle this, we also had to change the network device. The traditional one rack unit element was now two rack units. This device here also houses that embedded encryption module I mentioned earlier. Uh, hence the need for so many extra speed holes on the left side versus the right. There is likely a whole talk on this uh, in this space. For those here, like JR mentioned, we have a handful of these devices here and some of the cables. Please come by the AWS Village on either the infrastructure or networking stands. These innovations also um, had a, a, another tangible benefit, super important to all of us, which is that the, we're able to run over most of our inter-DC and inter-AZ links at about 65% of the power consumed by our most advanced internally developed equipment, which was even better than what you could get in the industry. So in general, we're constantly driving down the power required to drive all of our interconnect interfaces. 
absolutely. Performance per watt is a real deal for us. So we've talked about some of the components. Um, Stevens mentioned that we've internally productized these racks. Um, it's, and part of getting all of this done is, or providing capacity to customers is to get from the manufacturing shop floor and into the network. So we're, we take these 12.8T switches, we use them consistently, as Stephen pointed out, at all layers of the network. We have a very small number of rack configurations and our, our rack integrators put these all together. Where they, burn in, they do burn-in testing to test the hard robustness and on the robustness of all those internal interconnected complex cables that are kind of slight, nicely tucked away that you noticed in there. Um, by taking this approach, which is really fantastic, is we can late bind which rack ends up in which data center. So we can have the racks being built. We know we need X number of version X and another ver of version Y and we ship them wherever we need them, when we need them, in that lane binding mechanism. And that's because of the interchangeability and interoperability of almost all of our components. Once these racks end up in the data center, um, we do an inventory of the rack itself and most of the switch internal components. We compare that inventory against the as-built bomb, both from the rack integrator as well as our manufacturers, and make sure nothing has changed in flight. So, if someone, it, it's a bad day when someone changes a fan somewhere along the way that wasn't cataloged and tracked or anything else like that because we're inventorying all of these systems. At that point in time, we completely wipe everything on the system and install everything with AWS controlled binaries. This is the operating system, the bootloaders, the, any of the hardware FPGAs, anything that's possibly programmable is completely wiped and re-imaged at that point in time. Then we go back and redo the link level testing inside the rack, and we become comfortable with that rack level testing. We start testing the links as they connect to other things, either northbound or southbound. And at some point in time, we're comfortable with all the connectivity and the quality of everything, and then we flip the thing on and put it into service, and that's about 400 terabits of network switching capacity that we flip in at that moment in time. Stephen started to talk about, we started building the network using standard routing protocols such as Open Shorter's Path First or OSPF or Border Gateway Protocol, the protocol that runs most of the internet. We did this because these protocols were very well understood by our network design engineers, but also, let's face it, that was what was in the OEM kit that we were buying and building our systems with. But as we grew, we found out that these protocols lacked operational controls that we needed, but they also had a whole set of characteristics that made them very unideal for highly parallel networks. A couple examples to, that are maybe obvious to some but are kind of worth talking about. If you look at the image on your left, um, if I have a, a source in, in box A that wants to reach a destination in box B, the way a classical routing protocol would work when there's a whole bunch of links that are interconnected is it would show reachability up until the very, very, very last link gets broken. Now, if you think about that, we talked about performance, and, in and we want to remove any perception of failure or issues from the customers. We don't want you to see anything that happens under the covers when it's not going quite as we'd like. That's not okay. What we need to have happen is we need to decide to take the path from A through C to get to B long before we get down to one link. Another example is maybe a little bit less obvious is if you look at the image on your right, um, if I have a, a source in W and I want to reach a destination in Z, I can take paths through two different network partitions, one X and one Y. Most routing protocols have a mechanism of, of aggregation or subdividing the protocol domains that you can use to, to make these routing protocols scale, um, but it ends up all of those mechanisms make that path slightly opaque. So in this particular case, the, path, the, the connection between X and Z has eight links, but the connection between Y and Z only has four active links because the other four are out of service or have failed or something like that. Classical routing protocols in W would evenly distribute the load over X and Y. We don't want that to happen. We want that load to be distributed in a balanced way such that two thirds of the traffic goes to X and one third of the traffic goes to Y. Kind of obvious when you look at the picture, but that's not how the protocols work. 
So we started off <clears throat> by looking at OSPF and BGP and thinking of ways we can enhance them and adding a couple little knobs and features in there. And as we were going through that exercise, the, the networking industry started considering this concept. It's commonly known as software-defined networking. It's kind of more of a leader-follower architecture. Um, and we started trying to look at that and th trying to decide, do we prefer distributed routing protocols? Or do we prefer leader-follower, these SDN kind of centralized protocols? And, and how do we want our system to work? We really, really like the static stability and the limited failure domain of the distributed protocols. But we also like the visibility and the, the prescriptiveness of these centralized models. So in true AWS form, we've built a hybrid control plane where we're able to retain a lot of the characteristics of the distributed model that we really like, but we also have this centralized mechanism that we can use to get the network to behave the way that we want as well as in, introduce the visibility as to how the network is behaving and track transactions throughout the system. So you might be asking me, great, we've talked about control plane, we've talked about all this stuff, how does this help approximate infinite bandwidth? Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but if we think about something like TCP, let's we'll just start with there. If you look at TCP in a highly parallel network, there's this kind of little minor flaw that occurs, which is any one socket or TCP flow will typically traverse a single path through the system. That path is selected by a whole set of mechanisms. The, the most common one is uh, using a hash function to, to hash the flow and pick a set of links to go down, and, and that gets you to router X, which then moves you to router Y, and so on and so forth, as shown through the picture. So you kind of only light up that one little path. Well, on that path, you can get little bits of congestion that occur, or you could get you know, packet drop for various reasons, or even worse, you could get a link that fails and you have to wait for the, for the protocol to reconverge around that. Well, TCP will react correctly in the face of that paper cut, but that's not really ideal. So at AWS, we invented some technology um, it was first introduced as elastic fabric adapter, um, kind of, I think it was 2018 or so. Um, it's also known as SRD. And what that allows us to do is to take multiple paths through the network. Um, this, the, if you look at this, the way these streams work, by spreading out, it starts at the, at the network adapter, this is the server side a bit, it spreads the traffic out, and that traffic takes multiple paths, even if it's a single socket, through the network. That means that if we ever have an impairment, whether it's a packet drop or, encrypt, or, or something along the way, we're still transferring data while that packet drop gets detected and mitigated and re reconstituted. In addition, we have this fantastic characteristic where we're distributing the load very, very evenly across all of these links, which means as you take more and more of these EFA or SRD endpoints and run them over the network, the network get, the kind of load gets really, really flat and very easily distributed, much easier to capacity manage. Now, historically, EFA, well, not historically, we use EFA and SRD underneath AWS services, and we've been using them for a while. Some of our customers use EFA for high-performance workloads. It ends up that traditionally you would have to modify your application to take advantage of these. This reInvent, I don't know how many people are paying attention, but Dave Brown announced ENA Express in his keynote, and this is where we've taken SRD technology and made it uh, available on all ENA adapters. So you just gotta go in and flip a switch and you get access to this without having to rewrite your application. Your sockets can, if you're communicating between AWS instances, can leverage SRD under the covers, effectively unbeknownst to you. That gives you that benefit with very, very, very low overhead on your application side. Oh, sorry, let me go back a second. Um, not sure how many people noticed this, but uh, ENA, SRD, and, and, and EFA are reasonably complex topics. I have a couple links with QR codes if you wanna learn more about them. They're very, very good talks that kind of break them down and explain how they all work. Um, I do suggest, though, that if you want to start getting into this topic, start with that ENA Express, Dave's keynote, and some of the literature that's came out from there, and then move forward. <clears throat> Once we get the switches into the network, we need to make sure that everything's operating as we expect. 
We have passive monitoring systems that collect hundreds of readings from each switch. Their counters, their sensors, and their events. Altogether, we capture more than 7 billion observations per minute. Let that settle on 7 billion. If I had a penny per observation, I'd buy this hotel. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> uh, but that's just the start. We've realized that the best way for us to understand the customer experience, or specifically your experience, is to try to emulate it or observe it directly. So we have these things we call active monitoring systems. We probe between AWS instances and to the edge of the AWS network to the tune of 1.5 billion observations per minute. This allows us to send probes that, that follow every little single path, and then we'll get down a little later on to what we do about those probes, but it helps us look for changes in latency, it helps us look for packet loss, it helps us look for unexpected behaviors because of changes in the system. On this same subject, we recently announced CloudWatch Internet Monitoring. It uses roughly that same mechanism where we have millions of devices out in the internet and we're able to collect readings from them on how the internet is behaving. We take those readings and we put them with cold uh, third party or in, you know, industry avail widely available industry data and we use that to identify impairments in internet connectivity. We do that for our services and as part of CloudWatch Internet Monitoring, you're able to do this for your services. So if you onboarded that, you can look for internet impairments and start designing your applications to move around them when it makes sense to you. So obviously this is a lot of data, but how does it help? Well, some of it's pretty easy, right? So some of it is, hey bud, this DRAM over here is busted, it's not working right. Some of it's, hey, this power supply or this fan failed. Those are what we call kind of easy signals. Those are pretty, those are straightforward. Some of them are much more complex. It's a very unhappy day when a backhoe takes out a fiber cable, but it's not nearly as rare as you might think. Um, so in that event, you can, as you can imagine, we're looking at thousands of observations that fire off. We're seeing link failures, we're seeing control plane changes, we see failures in the active monitoring systems, we see micro congestions, we see all kinds of crazy things all at the same time. <clears throat> this is where our data scientists and engineers have come together and they build our correlation engine. That engine looks at all of those, and what, uh, when this occurs, you know, in fairness, the control plane completely wraps, routes around it. So this thing does not, doesn't last for very long at all. However, what we're able to do is realize, A, all of these observations are related to this thing. We're, all, we're also able to recognize that we have indeed routed around it, but we're also able to start dispatching people to find out where was it cut? Who do we have to talk to to get it fixed? How do we make sure that our capacity is where we expect it to be? Are we capacity impaired? If we are, how, where, where are we gonna shift around to make sure that we're not capacity impaired? How do we look for unexpected behaviors in the network? This is all triggered off by the correlation systems when this event occurs. Some of these observations are a little bit more complex. So as Stephen pointed out, we deploy over a million switches in our network. That's a lot of switches. It ends up when you have these many pieces of semiconductor or silicon that you get these little tiny impairments that can occur where like a little bit corruption in a, a network in semiconductor memory. And that can cause packet corruption or packet loss. That is a paper cut for TCP or, or, or SRD. You'll drop the packet, it's not always dropping, it only happens every once in a while. The protocols are robust in the face of failure, so they, they continue to work, but it increases the mean time completion and it goes against our tenant around performance. We don't like that. We don't like non-performance systems. And so, and this, this is a case where our triangulation engines work. We have, with that active monitoring, we're able to figure out which device exactly is causing the problem so that we can raise that signal up. And all these signals go into our auto remediation system. This is the system that does something super brutal like in the case of the failed DRAM or the bad semiconductor memory where it tells the control plane, hey, take that device out of service and it fires off a ticket for somebody to come and replace the device as fast as possible so we can get everything back into service the way we expect. Um, that auto remediation system is also sits and monitors everything that we do operationally inside the network, 
whether it's deploying configuration updates, deploying, upgrading software, anything that's going on, it's watching the network to make sure that it's behaving exactly as we expect. And if something doesn't behave within the boundaries of what we expect, we immediately roll that change back, stop the system until we can understand what's happening. Sometimes that, resu that results in us changing a process. Sometimes that results in finding a software fault really, really early, long before we've deployed it completely. Sometimes that just means that our check was a little bit off. But by rolling back, it allows us to not impact customers when these things occur. Now, that may seem slightly conservative, but we have that under tenant around security, reliability, and constantly moving forward. And that forces us to sit on top of that problem, whatever it is, get it fixed so we can keep the system going to deliver that persistently consistent network that Stephen was mentioning. Getting towards the ends, folks. With all these things going on, we do want to talk about how do we keep it all in sync? As we've mentioned, we've elected for the best of both worlds with this hybrid control plane with local decisions for speed, but also a centralized view for optimizations. With well over the million network devices, no single system can reason about every element, nor would we want it to, or it would violate our cellular goals and our AZ independence. So to do this, we create these abstractions between these layers, and we create controllers to supervise specific requirements. This might be to ensure that the traffic is evenly spread, or that we're coordinating, intentionally taking that bundle of fibers out in a slow, hitless, methodical way. So doing this centrally gives us the visibility that we want to make sure that our operations stay simple. Now, a lot of our examples have been about the data center, the data center network, but most of these also um, are true of the backbone network, the border, the internet edge. These are all the same for us. They all have the same requirements on security, performance, and availability, and scale. So this all is true for CloudFront, Global Accelerator, and Red53 that all rely on the network underneath. The problem may be slightly different. In the data center, we may have a very short, very wide network. And across the backbone, we may have a very long, less wide network. And so we, we split the controllers up to do the roles differently. So looking towards the future, and rather than operate 100 related but independent systems, we want something that helps us stitch these things together, ensuring that the expected changes match our expectations, and we want to make sure our abstractions never fight against each other. That would be the worst. So the networking industry is working with concepts such as intent-based networking. The IETF has just published a new RFC on the concept to help under, you know, use common concepts and definitions. So intents are incredibly powerful for us. They ensure that multi-domain areas, such as routers and controllers, are working together on the same problem. We are still early on this journey, and there's a lot of work yet to be done, but we actively think of intents and expected behaviors from our substrate network. This area is where our teams will spend an increasing amount of time over the next few years, and ensuring that we're confident that the systems that we're building are operating as expected. So thank you all for joining us as we've talked about some of the how and a lot of the why we develop and the, and the origins and the guiding principles behind what we've done for the AWS network. We're constantly striving to deliver a seemingly invisible network to you and your applications, and we really thank you for spending the time with us. Stephen and I are here after this session and at the booth in AWS Village if you have any questions to follow on. Thank you very much. Oh, and by the way, um, if you don't mind, if you get a chance, please fill out the survey. Let us know if you like sessions like this. As Stephen pointed out, it's reasonably rare for us to talk about this type of technology outside. The more interest customers have in hearing about it, the more we're able to talk about it. And we're, we're obviously interested and very excited about what we do.